Good morning. Welcome to this gathering hosted by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Bowling Green. Whether you're here in person or online, we're so glad to see you today on this beautiful spring morning. My name is Michelle Steiner, and I'll be your associate. Please set your cell phones to silent so that we can be fully present with one another. We are a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, however you identify, wherever you come from, and whoever you love, you are welcome here. Our Sunday services are different each week so that we can honor and learn from a wide array of traditions and beliefs. Today, our speaker is our very own Janine Grossmeyer. Janine joined, this, uh, joined AUU congregation in Maryland in 1996, and she's been a member of the UUCBG for 10 years. She is the author of A Lamp in Every Corner, our UU storybook. She enjoys history, genealogy, and writings of Ursula K. Le Guin. For Unitarian Universalists, the flaming chalice is a symbol of the light of learning and the love of our community. As our congregation's chalice is lit, we invite you to light yours at home. This morning, our chalice will be lit by James Miller. We will sing Rise Up, O Flame in a round, I believe. A yes. uh, two-part round? It's a two-part round, and uh, Ryan is going to be leading that side of the room. I'll be leading this side of the room. We'll do it three times through. Once and together, and then two apart? And then, uh, we'll do, no, three times, three times. As, as, a, round. as a round. Okay. All right. And then it's uh, 188. It's number 188 in your hymnal. You like to read those little dots on the page. I think it's 362. 362. Rise up, O Flame. Oh, that's right. So, I'm sorry. That's, that's the first hymn. Yeah, I'm sorry. 362. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> We have our opening words. Our opening reading today is um, from the Tao Te Ching uh, by Lao Tzu. The uses of not. Thirty spokes meet in the hub where the wheel isn't is where it's useful. Hollowed out clay makes a pot where the pot's not it where the pot's not is where it's useful. Cut doors and windows to make a room. Where the room isn't, there's room for you. So the profit in what is, is in the use of what isn't. And now we will have our opening hymn. Rise in body or spirit. Another round. Another round. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for participating. Now we will have a unison reading of our mission statement. Our mission is to be a caring community that encourages spiritual growth and actively works to improve our society and the environment. Now I'd like to invite Janine up for the time of all ages. Thank you, Michelle. So this is a sharing moment, story time. We do this as kind of a community thing. Do we have any young people in the room today? Little ones? <laughs> yes, young at heart, young at heart counts. No short people though, short people, okay. All right, sort of short people, really short. So y'all can just stay where you are. I will, however. So long ago and far away, because that's how all these stories start, right? A young person wanted to learn, and they'd heard of a great teacher. And they traveled far and long to get there, and they finally got to the great teacher's house, and they came up, and they knocked on the door, and they said, great teacher, teach me what you know. The great teacher said, come in. Very polite. Sit down. Let's have tea. So then the teacher made tea, which is pre-made here. It's very green tea. And the teacher said, I will pour you a cup. We will now have a few moments for meditation, reflection, and prayer. The singing bowl will lead us into silence. After the silence, you're invited to sing, join in singing the song, Spirit of Life. The words are on the screen.
So this responsive reading, your words are going to be on the screen. My words are just here in front of me. And if you would read them as they come up for you. I'll start. You don't like responsive readings. <laughs> we don't like responsive readings. Responsive readings run contrary to everything you believe in as a Unitarian Universalist, because instead of formulating your own thoughts and opinions in your own unique way, you simply repeat words that I have chosen for you. <laughs> like a store-bought reading card, responsive readings have us the ability to choose the words and expressions that we ourselves would have chosen. Look, I can make you moo like a cow. Oh, come on. Seriously. Or bleat like a sheep. Repeat after me. I will never, ever mindlessly repeat words that someone else has chosen for me. Yeah. I'm glad to see you did that as a round. That was, that was well done. We're almost done. And I will always take charge of my thoughts by formulating them in my own unique way. So that was written by a Unitarian Universalist, and I had his name there at the front, which I'm going to go back to because there he is, Mohan Embar. Uh, he wrote it about 20-some years ago. Has anybody heard that one before? No. Okay. Apparently it's a classic, and you maybe can tell why. <laughs> Unitarian Universalism and the Value of an Empty Pot. I'm going to start with a joke, and I have to tell you it's a joke because not everybody always laughs when they hear it, so I'm warning you. <laughs> this is supposed to be funny for some people. So one person said to another, said, hey, I'm taking a month-long class on the history and theology of Unitarian Universalism. And the other person said, uh, good, yeah, what are you going to do on day three? <laughs> so... The joke there, <clears throat> and that sort of is the implication that you use one don't have much of a history and or don't have a theology. Uh, and the truth is, it's kind of the opposite. We don't have a theology. We have a lot of theologies. Um, what do Unitarians and Universalists and Unitarian Universalists believe? And if you have a room with three of us in it and you say, what do you believe? You're going to get five, six, seven, eight answers. <laughs> So we're not really focused on what, per se, each person believes, but more on how we act towards each other. And that's the main thing we use to bind ourselves as a group, is being nice to each other and treating each other well and trying to make the world a better place. But we're pretty mellow about whether someone believes in, in however they envision the deity or if they don't envision one at all. So for us, religion, is a private matter. Um, this goes way back. This is Thomas Jefferson, our third president. It does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It picks, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. So he was quite involved, of course, in the setting up of our country. And these were people who had come out of a lot of religious wars, very ugly religious wars in Europe and some quite unpleasant uh, episodes here in this country. And so they made sure that the new country, the United States of America, um, said freedom of religion was going to be an important part of it. They weren't going to get really upset with each other over what each other believed. As long as you behaved properly and were nice to each other and didn't break the laws, you could believe pretty much what you wanted. And that idea obviously has developed over time and changed some through the years. Here is our First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof in 17, 
1988. We are not a Christian nation. We were never intended to be a Christian nation. We are a nation where all faiths are theoretically, ideally welcome. Uh, George Washington, when he wrote to the synagogue in New Jersey, said as much, and it's in the treaty, John Adams, the Treaty of Tripoli, John Adams specifically said, because it was a treaty with a, a nation mostly of Muslims, said this is not a Christian nation. Some people nowadays are saying that we are intended and have always been a Christian nation. No, we have a lot of Christians who live here, but the nation as a nation is not a Christian one. Now pilgrims and Puritans did come here seeking religious freedom in the 1600s. They were not real good about giving it to anybody else though. Uh, they wanted their way of doing it, but they didn't want other people to do it different ways. And uh, this is some of what they get up to. I don't know if you can see, they're putting people in stocks. One fellow was jailed for three years because he worked on the Sabbath. They put him in jail, long time. Um, also had to pay a fine and all kinds of things. So at that time, people were on a frontier society and they thought it very important that everybody did everything together. And that they all believed they were all in the same mind and they all agreed with each other and they thought that that was necessary for their survival. Um, Minister Jonathan Edwards of New England, he gave a sermon in 1741. It had some horrifying images of fire and brimstone. I mean, this is kind of the boilerplate where this phrase came from, and it was fairly common back then, warning you about the dangers of hell and what was gonna go wrong. Um, we kind of expect the devil and hell to be scary. What was kind of interesting about this sermon is that God is kind of scary too. Uh, here's a quote from it. I'm gonna read that. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some lonesome, lonesome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. Cheery Sunday, Sunday message. Yeah, that sermon today is known as Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And you could, there were more, that was just one of that. And he went on for a while about how God was angry with us and we needed to repent and then he would forgive us and not toss us into hell. Someone drew an illustration of that. Yeah. So this kind of, he was part of a religious movement that believed in predestination Either you're going to hell or you're going to heaven. God had already decided. It didn't really matter what you did in your life. The die had been cast, your fate had been written, and nobody was sure which you were, if you were one of the elect who got to go to heaven, or like most everybody else, we're gonna to go to hell, which was that horrible place. And that was a religious uh, theology that was common at the time. And that started uh, in the 1600s. It's kind of a depressing theology, I think, um, along came the Universalists. And they got started mid 1700s, a little earlier, uh, started in Europe, and some of them came here, and then some people here converted to that. And they said, no, they read the Bible, because now the Bible was being printed. And they said, the Bible says God is a loving God. God is not going to cast anybody into hell and damnation forever and ever and ever. Everyone gets saved universally. It's universal salvation. And that was their God, their religious belief. So two very opposed systems there. John Murray, he was born the same year that John Edwards gave that sinner in an angry God's sermon in 1741. He was born in England. He was a minister there. He was preaching the predestination doctrine, and then he started listening and he converted to universalism and he started preaching that. Well, he lost his job, he lost his friends, he got put in jail, his wife died, his child died, he lost all his money, and he said, I'm going to America. So he came over to the colonies 
And he happened to land near New, on the coast of New Jersey. His ship washed up on the shore. And they managed to get out and wade in. And he met a guy named Thomas Potter. And Thomas Potter said, oh, you are the man we have been waiting for. We have a church ready for you to preach in. And John Murray had been kind of burned out for the preaching. He's like, I, no, no. Mm -mm. And Thomas said, if you're still here on Sunday, will you preach? Well, it took a long time to get the boat fixed. And sure enough, John Murray was still there on Sunday and he preached and the message was quite well received. He gave them hope instead of hell. And he decided he would become a universalist minister here in America. And so he's one of the founders here. And the place where he landed is now Murray Grove Retreat Center. And you can go there now. It's a nice place to visit. So we can see that the, uh, the history is going on. And one reason I'm talking about history, at the beginning of the year, the Sunday service team gets together and says, is there something like a theme we want to go over this year? And this year our theme was UU history. Uh, I did a talk a little while ago about UUs and social justice. And Ken gave a talk about UUs and the women's movement, which kind of intersects. And so this is more about what UUs believe, what Unitarians, Universalists have believed through the years. And so we, right now we have the Universalists believing that everybody gets saved. There's another group at the time. Most Christians, in fact Christians, by definition are Trinitarians. They believe that Christ is divine, God is divine, and well, most of them I believe have the Holy Spirit. That's where the Trinity comes from. God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're Trinitarians. Unitarians said, they read the Bible, and they said, yeah, we don't see that. We see Jesus as, as special and, and holy and to be revered, but we don't see Jesus as God. And so they were Unitarians. They believed one God, God the Father, that's it. Uh, Jews and Muslims were also considered Unitarians because they believed in one God. Well, this is heresy. This is denying the divinity of Jesus. So clearly you're a heretic. They were not welcome and they got persecuted and had to kind of hide and, and be careful how they spoke. They came over here and some of them started congregations. They were Unitarian ministers. Um, and they got organized here in 1825 with this fellow, William Ellery Channing. And as you leave today, as you go out, on either side of the door, there's a little plaque because this room is named the William Ellery Channing Sanctuary after this fellow. And he gave a sermon in 1825, and he claimed the name Unitarian. He said, yes, that is what we are. And after that, they stopped trying to pretend they were something else, and they said, yes, we're gonna adopt that as our name. He also talked about the Bible, and I'm gonna go ahead and read that. Our leading principle in interpreting scripture is this that the Bible is a book written for men in the language of men, and that its meaning is to be sought in the same manner as all books. Now, all books and all conversation require in the reader or hearer the constant exercise of reason. We profess not to know a book which demands a more frequent exercise of reason than the Bible. So, he was saying, we're not gonna accept the Bible just on faith. We're going to think about it. We're going to consider it. We may come to a different understanding as we read and understand it more. And so for him, revelation, the understanding of the Bible wasn't like done, sealed, finished, forever staying the same. It changed as people understood more and learned more. And so that's kind of setting the point for Unitarianism. It says, we're going to keep learning, we're going to keep thinking and keep understanding things. So he was, that was 1825, in the 1820s and 1830s, transcendentalism started. Did anybody hear about this in English class? Transcendentalist writers, Henry David Thoreau. I had no idea it was religious too, but it was. Um, and they, it was a philosophical, spiritual, and literary movement. They believed in the inherent goodness of people, their transcending nature. They, get, they would commune with nature to connect with the divine, with God. They thought God was revealed by going out into nature. Um, and they believed in self-reliance and personal experience. William uh, Henry David Thoreau went into the uh, pond, you know, stayed by the pond for a while. So that's 
how this transcendental club came along. Oh, that color doesn't show up too well, I'm sorry. These are some of the people who are in it. I call it the club of people with three names. We have, <laughs> I always wondered why they got three. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller, Amos Bronson Alcott, he's Louisa May Alcott's dad. Theodore Parker, Henry David Thoreau, and William Henry Channing, who is the nephew of Ellery Channing. Now, after doing some genealogy, I now know why they have three names, is because everybody had the exact same name all the time, and so <laughs> they had to use all three so they knew who they were talking about. So they did a lot of writing and um, converted a lot of people to this Unitarian viewpoint of Commit connecting with God through nature. Reverend Thomas Starr, he was raised as a universalist and then became a Unitarian minister. This is when the two religions are still separate. And someone said, hey, what's the difference? So he came up with this, another joke. <laughs> Universalists believe God is too good to damn them. Unitarians believe they are too good for God to damn. <laughs> So they have a lot in common. They both believed in a loving God. They believed that, and that men, people, were good, inherently good, and could get better. So they wanted to make the society better. They were quite busy with education, helping um, poor people, helping people in uh, insane asylums, abolitionism. They were trying to get rid of slavery, uh, trying to give more people the vote. So all of these things kind of tied into their religious and moral beliefs. And they used reason in religion. They thought about stuff. They also started, and it took a while, slowly to include more people and treat not just men but women as completely, uh, fully spiritual and human. They had some of the first female ministers in the 1800s. And then in the 1900s, we started including LGBTQ people, uh, people of color, and we're starting to expand now, everybody I'd quoted so far has been a white male, and I'm aware of that. Um, so, but they were some of the early ones, and that's where we started. But we did start having more and more people in it. In 18, now we're up to 1940s, so we've skipped a bit. The Humilati decided that universalism had gotten stuck and needed revitalizing, and they came up with this symbol which was the cross off in the center of a double circle. And they wanted to pursue an intense spiritual journey into ministry and work mightily to transform the Universalist Church from a struggling dissident Christian sect into a religion of greatness. And that was their goal. And um, what happened in 1961, about 15, 20 years after that, was the Unitarians and the Universalists had sort of been doing this Hey, you want to get together? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe we can get, maybe we'll go out coffee sometime. Yeah, okay. Maybe and then that. Yeah. Anyway, they did this for about 50, 60 years, and they finally decided to uh, to connect. And in 1961, they did what they call a consolidation. It was not a merger. Uh, they kept their own separate identities. There are some churches now that are called Unitarian churches. Some churches that are called Universalist churches. There are a few that are called Universalist Unitarians. Uh, but if a church was started after the merger in 1961, it's likely to be called a Unitarian Universalist Church. Or, since that's quite a mouthful, UU, which means nothing to anybody who's not one, but <laughs> that's the problem with initials. Um, I do believe, I think this picture was just taken at an angle, but I think the circles are supposed to be the same size. And over here we have the cross off center again, that's the Universalisms, and here's the chalice from the Unitarian Service Committee. And those two symbols, the two circles and the chalice, were put together to make a chalice. And this is the chalice we had for quite a while. It's the chalice that's on the front of your gray hymnal. And it, when I say, and it's slightly different. Notice these subtle changes. This has got like a wavy top. This has got a flat top. Um, and this was used by UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association. Every congregation pretty much makes up its own chalice. Just like every Unitarian Universalist makes up their own understanding of what they believe. So there's a lot of variation, a lot of change. <clears throat> um, they changed to this one, which I think of as the, 
sunburst. Some people thought it looked like a spider web. And about <clears throat> 10 years ago, they switched over to this one, which is a, a U inside a U. Uh, they lost the circles. If you Google UU chalices, <laughs> Uh, you get this, so you can see some of the variations in the Unitarian Universalist chalices that different congregations used, and then there's some for um, the different organizations within UU. Uh, the Green Sanctuary has one with a leaf, and help me out, somebody, anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. But it shows some of the variety and creativity within our congregation. So, anybody here ever done an elevator speech? You know what one is? Okay. There's, there's a, <clears throat> a story in the Bible. I think it's in the Bible. Maybe it's the um, writings. Please explain the law of Moses while standing on one foot, which is basically an elevator speech. How can you do this really, really quick? And so, who said that? Does anybody know who did that? Hillel? Is that the guy? He said, be kind to your neighbor and honor the God, honor the Lord. Everything else is commentary. So he condensed it all <laughs> to that. So one of the exercises that we get is, how do you explain Unitarian Universalism? If somebody says, what does it mean to be a UU? How do you answer that? Anybody have any they want to share? I tell people we like people. We like people, okay, good. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of everybody. That is uh, one of our principles. Yes? Mm -hmm. My dad called it the church of what's happening now. The church of what's happening now. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you. Well, I found this on the uh, internet. Um, Doug Mutter wrote this in 2010, and it was in New You World. And this was his elevator speech, and he sort of talked about it for a while, and he extracted these five points. Unitarian Universalism, it's an evolving religion, not a revealed religion. It changes over time. The pot, what's in the pot changes over time. We started with a fairly Christian bent, got transcendentally for a long time, very into social justice in, in the 1900s. Uh, then some more spiritual people said, we want some more spirituality. We got some pagans coming in. We have UU atheists, UU Christians, UU Buddhists, lots and lots of different people bring their own traditions here. So what is a Unitarian Universalist changes through the years, who's talking, and through our own lives we may change what we believe in and what we do as a Unitarian Universalist. So it's evolving, it's not static. UUism is about this life, not so much focused on the afterlife. Not all of us believe in an afterlife. We're focused, what's happening now? What's happening here? Focuses on actions and experiences, not so much on beliefs. We all have our own individual beliefs, but we're willing to let everybody figure that out for themselves and focus more as a group what we can do together. We are democratic, not hierarchical. We do not have a pope. We elect, everybody elects, the president of UUA, but they're just president of the association. They're not president of our congregation. Each congregation makes its own decisions. And we envision a harmony between goodness and happiness, not the sacrifice of one to the other. So you can be happy and good at the same time. You don't have to stop being happy just to qualify as, as good. So that's his elevator speech, what he thinks Unitarian Universalism is. And I invite you all to think about what makes it Unitarian Universalism for you. One of the beauties of this religion is, I, I don't wanna say you can make it up as you go along, although we kinda do, at least I did. I didn't have much when I came in. I had some things I knew I believed, some things I knew I didn't believe. And I took one of the building your own theology classes and listened to a lot of different people. And over the years, what's in my UU pot has shifted and changed. So, and some days maybe you're in the mood for chili. Maybe next day you want oatmeal, and that's cool. You can dump the pot out and start over and change it. And you're still a UU. So what's in your UU pot? And what does your UU pot look like? I mentioned the pot, there's many kinds of pots. We have crock pots, flower pots, and of course the cauldron pot. 
So all of those could be your pot. And you can, again, you can get a different pot. And maybe, maybe your pot is broken. Maybe your pot has cracks. That's okay. Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of those three name guys, there is a crack in everything God has made. And a little while later, a philosopher named Benjamin Blood came along and said, through that crevice enters the light of heaven. And you may have heard it as a song. Leonard Cohen, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So I invite you to consider your pot cracked, whether you're a crack pot, uncracked pot. <laughs> What you want to keep in it, if you want to stay, have it stay empty for a while, and that's okay too. This is a Japanese technique where the pot has cracked, has been repaired with gold. They don't try to hide the broken part. They honor them because it shows what the pot has been through. And so some of us do have cracks, so I encourage you to work with that, maybe repair yourself a little bit of gold bling, be cheerful about it, and keep on going. And I enjoy, uh, hope you enjoy whatever is in your pot. So thank you. Yes, you can clap. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Janine, for that wonderful talk. It's hard not to clap after that. <laughs> this congregation and the work we do is supported by the voluntary generosity of all who contribute. As we enjoy the music, the offering will be given and received in grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values. We thank you for these gifts. May we use them wisely in the service of our congregation and our community. We have next community news. Um, we are going to have the membership team Q&A after the service next week, I believe. 
new member ceremony on the 21st. Events today include a watch party uh, connecting with the natural world at 1230 in the TV lounge on the ground floor of the Fellowship Hall. Today also is Green Sanctuary meeting during social hour in the Fellowship Hall. Elements of Dance, uh, 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And next week, Sunday service how-tos, a little class if you ever wanted to know and wanted to help us put on our Sunday service, it'll be 10 a.m. in this room. Uh, next Sunday, Just As I Am, Why Universalists Don't Do Altar Calls, with guest speaker in person, Reverend Misha Sanders. If you'd like to know more, even more, about uh, how our congregation uh, uh, puts into practice Unitarian Universalism, uh, please contact members of our membership team or our board president. If those people would raise their hands, please, and they'd be happy to fill you in. I think we're ready for our last hymn, Rise in uh, Body or Spirit. And it's number... Number 286. Four times. This is a new one for us, so I'm going to sing this to you so you can have the melody in your head. But what's really interesting to me is all hymns have names in our books, and the names are at the bottom of the pages. The name of this particular one that was composed in 1986 is called True Religion. <laughs> the core of silence breathes beyond all words. Or else the words have little worth. In heart or soul or spirit it comes forth. The words we name them matter not. And we'll sing that first verse in all three verses. So please stand as you are willing in body or spirit. us our final reading. From T.S. Eliot. What we call a beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. We will now bid farewell to those who have joined us online. We hope you found this service meaningful, and we invite you to join us again. Be well and go in peace.